Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Nature Drawing. My name is James Sisti. I'm a professional artist and a wilderness guide, and today I'm your instructor. This is an introductory lesson where we're going to be exploring the different forms of nature art. We're going to be talking about a lot of different subjects today. So again, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, speak up and to um, allow me to be a resource for you today. Uh, I'm going to be working with my top-down camera as well, which we have right here. And I'm also going to be sharing my screen with you here. Okay, so let's get started. So uh, just a breakdown of today's agenda. We're gonna be talking about our goals. We're gonna be going over what kind of kit that we use in our practice. And we're also gonna be talking about how we can get started in our own uh, nature drawing practice. Uh, we'll do a group warm-up exercise together. I had sent an email with two attachments. These are reference photos that we're gonna be using. Um, I will put those inside the Zoom chat in case everybody doesn't have that attachment. Um, and that way we'll be able to work in tandem. We'll also be going through a landscape drawing exercise, a nature journaling exercise, and then finally we'll conclude with some inspirational tips for you folks to continue your practice after class and uh, finally announcements. Okay, so what is our goal? When we talk about nature drawing, really what we're experiencing is more than just an art form. We're taking ourselves and we're, pro we're projecting us into an environment that is living, breathing environment. It's nature. And the goal of nature drawing is to connect with it and become closer with it and to explore it. And in exploring nature, we're going to observe a lot and we're going to learn a lot. And it's always a benefit for us to not only absorb these learning points, but also to turn them into teaching points and share what we have observed and learned with other people. So it's a great habit to form, especially if you're, you've been um, you know, looking to find another creative avenue or another creative vehicle. Um, and it's something that you will continue to, to build and get better with over time. And the best part about it is that it's not that hard to get started. It's not an expensive hobby. Really, the bare minimum that you need is a sketchbook or some paper, uh, a pencil, and a pen. That's it. That's the bare minimum you need. And anything else that you'd like to add, colored pencils, watercolor, um, even if you're more scientifically inclined and you like to collect specimens and stuff, that's all add-ons, right? The price for entry, real cheap. Sketchbook, pen, and pencil. That's it. Okay, so it's not like you're going to break your bank getting involved in this. And really, when you want to consider how to get started, we have folks who are interested in all sorts of natural history subjects. For example, we have people who are very much into things like birds and butterflies and flowering plants, landscapes. There's a whole slew of different subjects for you to really channel your creativity towards. And Really, when you go on a nature walk or you spend time in nature, you're opening yourself, you're opening up your mind, and you're opening up your observational skills to the things that are happening around you. And when you put yourself in that position, you're really get, getting into the right mindset to begin doing something creative, okay? So what we're gonna do is a brief warm-up exercise, and I'm gonna teach you my technique. If you've been in a workshop with me before, you're very familiar with this. If it's your first time, don't worry. We're gonna work very slowly and we're gonna be able to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to absorb the lesson. So really what we're gonna do is I'm gonna switch my camera to, well, first I'm gonna share my reference photo with you. This is a photo that I attached in the email. If you didn't receive that, um, I'll drop it in the chat as well. But it's a simple walnut. We're gonna work on how to set up our drawing. Okay, meaning before we put on our artist hats, we're gonna put on our architect hats. We're gonna put together a plan and we're going to build a drawing together. Okay, and I'll show you what that means in just a second. So I'm gonna to switch to my top-down camera here. And again, if you didn't see this photo attached in the email, I am going to put this in the group chat on Zoom. So everybody will be able to access this file. And here we go, boom. All right, so that should upload in just a second. Great, so how do we get started, right? So I have a couple of basic materials here. I have two types of pencils, a, one with a harder lead and one with a softer lead. 
And I'll show you the difference between them in just a minute. I also have a kneaded eraser, which is a great cheap investment. It's a malleable eraser that doesn't leave behind a pink residue or scuff up the page. That's why I like this particular kind of eraser. And then finally, a good old fashioned pencil sharpener. All right, the paper I'm working with, and I'll just adjust my camera so you can see, is uh, just plain printer paper with a uh, three hole punch on either side. And that's because I like to keep my drawings together in one place. Some people have nature journals, other people have binders, I have both. So for this exercise, we're going to use one sheet of white paper, okay? And we're going to fold it in half, okay? We're gonna be using a couple of different techniques today, so I want to maximize the utility of the paper itself. And the first thing I have all my students do is simply to draw a rectangle or a margin around their page, just like this. And the reason why I do this is because A, it's establishing the territory that I'm responsible for as an artist, okay? So everything happening inside this box is my world. And it's also given me a space to write in different notes, and it's a, it's a good way to also get yourself organized too. So that's it. We start by drawing a rectangle, okay? And again, I'm gonna be showing this just one more time so that we can all be on the same page here. This is the reference photo that we're gonna be working with. It's a walnut split in half, okay? And I'm gonna teach you my system for planning a drawing, all right? So we're gonna look at the open shell on the left, okay? And we're gonna also see that there's the uh, open shell with the nut on the right. First thing I like to do is to draw a line very, very, very faintly down the middle of my page here, okay? That's dividing my, my uh, rectangle into two different rectangles. So I know that I'm gonna have one on the left and one on the right, pretty simple so far. Next, in order to make sure that my nature object fits, okay, I wanna make sure that this is something that will um, be proportional and accurate. Okay, I'm just gonna zoom in really quick here. I'm gonna take two steps, all right? And it's very simple. I'm gonna look at the width of the object and the height of the object. So what I'm gonna do, uh, assuming that this is a centered drawing, okay, and if you want, you could also draw a very, very light line down the center so you know where the middle of the page is. Um, you're going to put a dot on either side of the object, which will measure the length of the object, okay? So this is gonna tell us that our drawing is not going to exceed past or go past these two points, okay? Then secondly, I'm going to draw two dots to get the width. Okay, so I have length and width of my object. It should look like a little diamond, four dots, okay? And these are oblong objects, so it may not be a perfect square, may not be a perfect oval. We'll get there in a second, okay? So now that I have my length and my width figured, what's the next step? I always teach my class to think, again, Think like architects, okay? We're not going to start drawing yet. We're gonna begin planning now. If this is a round or a, um, an, an oblong type of a shape here, what we're going to do is we're gonna start with either end, okay? And we're gonna create an outline of our object. And the only way we're gonna do that is with a series of little dots like this. Bear with me. The idea of putting together a schematic first is really going to take a lot of pressure off of you when it's time to draw. Because if you remember, like tracing, you have a guideline that helps you to move swiftly and confidently. Okay? Just like if you're tracing something. So what we're doing here is we're planning, we're doing the hard work first of planning. And it's not an exact science. So if, for example, your dots are too wide, that's fine, you don't have to make everything perfect. That's, that's the best news I have to share with you today. Your drawings don't have to be perfect. Really what we're doing is we're considering the outline or the profile based on the reference photo that we're using. This also works for three-dimensional objects. So if you have something 
that you'd like to draw from one of your hikes, like a little shell or something like that, you can use this technique with a three-dimensional object as well as with a 2D object, right? So let me just adjust this camera again. So what we're going to do next is we're going to consider how this architectural element, this blueprint is going to evolve into a drawing. We did the outline. So now let's consider the interior architecture of our walnut shell, okay? Starting from this right-hand side where we made our dot, we're gonna notice that there is a little feature here, okay, it kinda looks like this. Okay, we have this little feature here, as well as a border, right? And I'm just gonna come around on this side so you can see from the, ca from the camera, we have a thick shell, right? And it's also not perfect, meaning that we have a lot of varieties or um, we have a lot of different physical properties here. It looks like a, a kind of papery sort of residue on the inside on this particular part of the shell. And again, I'm just looking at the photograph here. And it also seems like we have a woody texture in other parts like right here or right here. And just as you consider these different textures and properties, okay, we're just filling in the information that we need on the inner perimeter, right? So we're working from the outside in rather than the inside out. So just to recap, we started by laying out the, the, the length and the width of the object, and we created an outline of the object using dots. Then we moved in to the interior outline of the object because it's got a thick shell, okay? Now we're gonna actually begin by connecting the dots here. And I wanna emphasize that, for example, if you did an outline just like this, you don't have to trace the dots perfectly. They're just guidelines. So if you're, if you're really watching and paying attention to the reference photo here, you're gonna notice that, okay, maybe my shape is off. This is the time for you to correct that shape because now we're actually beginning to draw. Everything we did so far was part of a, a planning phase and that is what gives you the advantage as the artist. Notice how my height is slightly different now than when I originally estimated. That's not a negative thing, that's a good thing. I saw that my estimate wasn't quite accurate. So as I began to plot my coordinates, again, thinking like an architect here, I made the observation and shifted my width to fit more accurately to the reference photo. And you can do that too. Now that we're in this particular phase, again, don't feel pressured to force yourself to stick with the dots that you initially laid out. You can trace over them directly or you can move them. Eventually you can also even erase them if it's distracting to you. But again, we're, we're planning our drawing and then we're executing our drawing, not just jumping in without having a clear agenda here, okay? So this is just a, an outline of the walnut shell, right? So what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna consider, again, we have these different properties, these different textures happening inside the nut. I'm gonna look at this woody section over here and I'm just gonna connect the dots, okay? Very straightforward here. And I'm gonna continue down taking care to include some of these papery features that have been left over from when the, the shell was separated. Okay, because if, if you ever opened up a walnut, there's a, a lot of different textures inside and you can tell that there's like a sort of paper covering over the nut, similar to like if you opened a peanut. Okay, so that's gonna add a little bit of character to our drawing if we include that particular detail, All right? So I'm just going to continue and also notice that the the, the shell itself is kind of asymmetrical, all right? It's not going to be a perfect oval. It's gonna be kind of crooked in spots. It's gonna be overlapping with layers and other spots just like this. So it's a great opportunity to really flex your observational muscles here and to specify these variations in shape and texture in your drawing, okay? 
And it's such a simple and common object. You can do this with leaves. You can do this with acorns, pine cones. But next time you go on a hike in the park or you go for a walk in the garden, see if you can find something to bring indoors and study. Um, right now, it's autumn in the northeast of the United States. So we have plenty of specimens to choose from. A lot of the beautiful leaves are falling off the trees now. And it's just a great time to collect. And if you're collecting specimens, always make sure that you're doing it ethically. You don't want to kill or hurt anything. You want to make sure that, if anything, you have a better, you leave something better than you found it when you go outside into the, into the bush. So now what I'm doing here is I'm beginning to play, right? I did the hard work, which was plan the drawing out. Now we have some interesting stuff happening on the inside. We have some texture. I like how there's a, a light tan sort of color. And I'm just creating a little outline drawing of that, that tan texture there, okay? And it doesn't, again, it doesn't have to be perfect. This is just something that's giving me a bit of um, a filler, so to speak, so that now I have some content within my shell, okay? So what we're gonna be doing is just paying attention to the little bits of the nut that were left over after it was split open. Okay, and what this does is it gives a kind of um, a scientific observation to the viewer so that they can see what the inside of the shell looks like. You know, um, I always liked scientific illustrations that show the insides of volcanoes or the insides of different, um, you know, animals, things like that. So we're going to do a, a less graphic version by looking at the inside of a nut. But if you want to use your imagination, maybe you can add some insect life in there, draw some ants or some larvae. It's all up to you. Okay, now that we have these little contour textures in there, what I'm gonna show you next is a way to, to fill it in. It's kind of spruce your drawing up a little bit. And one way we can do that is by adding some line weight variation. All right, I'm gonna teach you all about that in just a second. So let's say, for example, our light source is coming from directly above, okay? If I were to place an object on the page in front of me here, okay, you'd see that I have a couple of light sources, but the majority of the shadow is on this side of the object, which would indicate that this side is darker than this side for all intents and purposes. One way to indicate shadow with your pencil is to draw a heavier line. So let's say, for example, if I were to make this line thicker on the bottom of the shell, it would suggest that there's a little bit of light play at work. Okay, and this line is the thickest line in the whole drawing. That's what I mean by line weight variation. If I were to take a good look at where the light source was, and I just notice all the different shadows that are occurring within the object, that's going to empower me as the artist to add a little flourish to my drawing in the form of line weight. Like for example, notice how I'm using it only on the bottom of certain features here. If you look at the reference photo, everywhere there's a darker shadow, up here included, if you add just a little bit of variety, a little bit of a thicker line in certain spots, what that is telling the user, I mean, I mean the viewer, is there's some shadow happening over here. And the best part is you're not even shading. You're just adding a thicker line strategically, not all the way around, just in strategic spots to demonstrate shadow, okay? And that works really nicely for when you want to begin your actual shading process, okay? so. Now that I've got the line weight variation accounted for, what next? I'm going to take my other pencil here, um, and you're going to notice that the pencil tip is a little bit blunted, and that's important because what we have here is a pointy pencil, which is what I use for drawing line weight, uh, drawing my line work, and then a blunted pencil or a chiseled tip pencil to begin shading. So when I shade, I'm just going to adjust my camera really quick here so we can get a better view. 
um, when I shade, what I'm considering is the fact that I'm now going to have to show, and I'm gonna tilt my drawing this way so you can see it a little bit better. I'm going to have to show a difference in light value, meaning uh, value is the relationship between dark and light. And the best way I can get a nice even application of shadow is by putting my pencil very lightly on the page. And I'm, I'm just, the pressure that you're adding here is minimal. You're just letting the weight of the pencil rest on the page. I'm gonna just change my grip just so you can see it a little bit better here. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna use very, very tiny circles. And you're just going to watch and make sure that there's a minimal of white space within the area that you'd like to shade, okay? And it takes a little bit of time. It's sort of meticulous, but it works very nicely for getting an even coat or a, a nice even consistency, okay? And all I'm doing is I'm noting where the darkest parts of the shell are first, and that's where I'm beginning to shade, okay? And for your homework, what I'm gonna have you do is you're going to draw the right hand counterpart to this. And that's got a lot of different textures and uh, a lot of great opportunities to bring out some of those shadows. So this technique is what you're going to use in shading, okay? And obviously, you're more than welcome to email me and send me your drawings as you practice, and I'll be happy to give you some one-on-one -on -one feedback. Okay, so the part that I'm not shadowing, shading in right now, this is the lighter area, and we're gonna shade in there in a little bit, but I just wanna make sure that I'm getting the darkest parts first, and I'm not pressing down hard at all. In fact, I'm being very light and very deliberate in not shadowing too hard because we're gonna have to change a little bit as we begin to shade in the lighter parts, right? We don't wanna just go all in and make things as dark as possible first because if you make a mistake, it's hard to erase. Okay, so that part's done there. Now on the other side, it's a little bit lighter, but we're gonna shade that in nonetheless. And then lastly, we're going to shade um, the lighter part, the lighter interior shell of the nut. Okay, just like this. Nice, soft circles, barely pressing down on the paper. Okay, and this system where we put on our architect hats, where we figure the length and the width, then we plot out our drawing in coordinates with dots. It's nice because everybody can draw a dot. It's the most simple form of mark making, really. And if you are able to work on something simple like a nutshell using that system, well, guess what? You can work on complex drawings too, right? Get, get warmed up with nature objects, draw 3D objects. And once you figure out how this system works for you, because it takes a little bit of practice, give yourself a bigger challenge. Try to tackle something that's outside of your comfort zone. And that way you're gonna be able to draw pretty much anything that you put your mind to. And you have the system in place that you can always rely on. If something doesn't look right, if something isn't working for you, fall back on the system and the system will support you. Okay, so now what I'm doing is I'm looking at the parts that I already shaded and I'm just going, I'm not pressing harder. I'm just going to add some of these features here that are a little bit darker and I'm not pressing any harder than I was before. I'm just spending more time in the same place. And what that's doing is it's depositing more graphite material into the tooth of the paper. And this is just consistency, right? We're, we're not pushing hard at all. We're just spending the time looking at our reference photo or looking at our nature object. And we're, we're putting in the time to making sure that we're not going too dark with our shadow and that everything looks nice and even. And if your pencil seems to not be cooperating, it might be the type of pencil that you're using. Um, these pencils that I like, the, uh, the Derwent, uh, the Palomino Blackwing pencils, I really enjoy the way that they distribute material onto the page. You know, not two pencils are created equal. So 
I, I tend to avoid using um, a school pencil, for example, because that was meant to fill out math problems and scantrons. This is more, this is more of an artist's tool. So that would be uh, one thing I'd recommend you pick up if you want to continue practicing drawing is just invest in a nice set of pencils. They don't have to be expensive, but um, companies like Palomino or Derwent or Generals are really nice starter sets um, that give you a lot of bang for the buck. Okay, and notice how I'm just going over places that I've already drawn on, right? We have little portions that are slightly darker, so I'm just going to go ahead and add a little bit more by simply making more, making more circles in a, in a concentrated area. That's it. Again, I'm not pressing hard at all. And now for the areas that we filled in earlier, I mean that we didn't fill in earlier, these are the lighter spots. You're going to notice something. As I fill this particular area in, it's going to kind of blend in. Watch. It's going to kind of blend in with the surrounding area. And that's okay. You're not going to lose what you put down. What you're going to have to do next is in order to make, continue to make this lighter, you're going to have to go over that other area on the outer perimeter, just like this, a little bit longer. Okay, and what that's going to do is it's, again, it's going to just bring down the light value, or it's going to make it darker, which will create a nice little contrast with the highlighted areas. Okay, now this is all in a nutshell. So everything inside the nutshell is going to have to be shaded in. Okay, but you don't have to go too dark just dark enough. You want to preserve some of these textures and some of the information, okay? And very, very lightly, very, very lightly. Just make those tiny little circles. And for the areas that are very highlighted, just leave the page blank. That whiteness of the page is what's going to work as your highlight. Okay, and if you feel like some of the stuff's getting lost in the, in the shuffle, just go into those areas that are a little bit darker, spend more time there, and you'll be able to bring out those darks very, very nicely, okay? Same thing around the edge, because there's kind of a lip around the edge of the shell. So, for example, right over here is gonna be a darker area. That's where we've used a thicker line when we added line weight variation. So that's a really good tip, if you see, a spot that's particularly dark and you already did the line weight variation there, that's how you know you're gonna add more shadow to it than the rest of the show. Okay. And again, I used that phrase earlier, we're constructing a drawing, we're building a drawing together. So that's, that's the idea, is that you're not just doing the drawing and it's done in one step, you're doing a little bit at a time, you're working in layers like a painter would, okay? And as you continue to construct your drawing, it's going to develop into a final product. And this multi-step system is what you will use to tackle any drawing project in the future. Okay? So that's the system. That's the basics. Now, what we're going to work on next is how we can apply this system to other types of drawings. Okay? So again, we worked with our nature object here. In the future, use a 3D object. Go, go on a hike or go in the garden and find something that's pleasing to your eye. Bring it inside and just study it. Study it with your pencil, just like we did with this walnut shell. And you might notice something you haven't noticed before. Okay, and if that's something valuable to you, if you feel like you learned something doing that, what a great opportunity to share that with a friend or a loved one. Okay, now some of these dots are residual from our planning process. If you don't like them, then you can just simply and very carefully come in with your eraser and get rid of them. Okay, or if you like the way they look and you want to show your process, feel free to leave them. That's okay too. Oh, another tip. If you uh, are concerned about sm smearing your, your paper when you erase, 
Um, one thing you can do is you can get a, a, a paintbrush or just another sheet of paper. And just wipe the eraser dust away with the other piece of paper and that way you won't be smudging it with your finger. Just like that, okay? So, um, yeah, and then finally, since it is a three-dimensional object, it's obviously casting a shadow. I'm just gonna take my pencil very, very lightly and I'm going to add a little tiny shadow on the outside so that it's not just floating in space. A nice, even shadow. And if you're interested in working with colored pencil, this is a technique I use with colored pencil too because as we add layers and layers of graphite, you can do the same thing with colored pigment. Okay, and you really can tell if you have a good colored pencil or not based on the wax to pigment ratio. Good pencils have less wax, more pigment, and they cost more, but it's because the pigment's expensive. Okay, there's my little shadow there. Very, very light shadow. Voila. Okay. So another thing that you can do to augment your drawings here is you can add some notes. Um, obviously, we, we know that this is a walnut shell. And if you want to add a little flourish, you can, there you go, exercise your penmanship skills. But it, it's, it's quite obvious what it is. Um, if, if, for example, you want to tell a little story about it, you can add, where did you find it, right? Um, uh, if we were on a hike, let's say, um, since I'm on Long Island, pretend we're in the Hamptons. Okay, so this tells a little story, it creates a context. If you want to add the date, you know, today's the 14th. Now we're adding a timestamp. So we, we state what the object is, we show the object, we state where the object's from and the date in which we found it. And now we have a little bit of a story developing here. If you want, you could also add another layer of information. For example, where I am right now, it's a, a clear sunny day. with a slight breeze. And let's say it's 15 degrees Celsius outside. Okay, so now we're adding another layer of information. So this is a really great idea. You have your, your drawing, you have your timestamp, your location, and now you have a weather. Um, little weather note and you know what you could even put who you went hiking with let's say uh let's say let's say shan joined me for a hike okay so now you have a person too so now you just continue this narrative as much as you'd like but it's a great way to take something that's very normal and mundane and turn it into something that's very personal and add um, a layer of information on top of that drawing, okay? So that's a very quick warm-up exercise for us. And next, what we're going to do, here we are, is we're gonna do a landscape, okay? And we're gonna use the skills that we exercised in this warm-up for our landscape drawing. And this is something that we did in our nature drawing intro class last Thursday. We did a, a landscape drawing there as well. So when it comes to drawing a landscape, we have our tools, right? Our pencils and our paper. Next, our job is to establish a visual hierarchy, okay? When we drew our nature object, we looked at the length, we looked at the width, but when it comes to drawing a complex thing like a landscape, you're going to have to figure a little bit more. 
So what do I mean by visual hierarchy? Okay, essentially, this establishes a focal point for our drawing. Okay, this was a picture I took when I was hiking out in uh, Mount Rainier National Park a couple of summers ago. And I wanted to take a picture of these beautiful flowers. So those are the objects in focus. They have the highest visual hierarchy in this photograph because everything else is blurred out in the background, right? The horizon, those trees, even the mountain itself, Mount Rainier, that's all blurred out. It's just a nice happenstance that those things, that those things are there occupying that space, but the photograph was of the flowers, okay? And we're gonna think about that as we begin this next drawing exercise. What's our focal point of this drawing going to be? And this is an example of using a focal point, right? This is a drawing of trees that happen to have a lot of clouds and mountains in the background. We're focusing on the trees in the foreground, for example. That's what this would look like. So here we have our landscape. And it's a brilliant autumn landscape with beautiful golden leaf foliage on these trees, some mountains in the background. And it's a very simple landscape because we're not going to tackle it like we would any other drawing. There's a system for landscape drawings as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share this image again in the group chat. This was also on the email I sent in advance. Um, so I'm going to do that now. And I'm going to focus again on my top down camera, but uh, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna flip over my page here, just like that. Okay, and I'm gonna use the other side of my paper waste not, want not, and we're going to, here, I'm just putting the image file in the chat right now, so that reference photo should be coming through. Okay, it's uploading, give it a second. There we go, perfect. Great, there you go. So, have that open and again we always start by squaring our page right so i'm just going to draw a border or a rectangle and this is the space in which i'm responsible for as the artist okay this is my territory okay it's also we're going to use this margin as a measuring tool this is a great little trick so Looking at our reference photo, okay, and I'm just going to share my screen with you again so that we can all look together as a class. Now, there's a margin drawn around this photograph here, right? Now, this margin is going to be our measuring tool because it's creating a frame around a three dimensional space, okay, and this frame has points where the landscape kind of goes off, goes off the edge, goes off the edge. And we're looking at a multi-layer landscape here. In the foreground, we have this beautiful forest with individual trees, and I'll show you how to draw these kinds of trees in just a second. In the middle ground, we have a forest that's just in between the mountain and this foreground here. And then finally, in the background, we have the mountain range, okay? All of the sky here is negative space. You can add birds, clouds, whatever your heart desires. But let's consider how these pieces of the landscape, these features, kind of are anchored to the sides of these margins here. So going from left to right, if I were to notice where this mountain is anchored to the side of the margin, That'll help me determine where I'm going to draw this mountain on my page, okay? Say it's about seven centimeters down from the top. And then if I look down maybe five centimeters, I'll notice that's where the midground, the middle ground is anchored to the side of the page. And then four more centimeters or five more centimeters, I'm gonna notice that's where the foreground begins, okay? And then the bottom of the page. So by illustrating the key points Guess what? You're going to put more dots on the paper. Illustrating these key anchor points is going to give us a good reference to begin. And that's how we use our margin or our border as a measuring tool. Let's look at the right-hand side. 
let's say for example we have a full 10 centimeters before the foreground begins from the top of the page to right here this anchor point that's an important thing that we want to observe while we're working on this landscape because this is going to actually become a line that goes across the page same here same here we're going to look and see where the beginnings and ends are of these lines and that's how we're going to get a nice layered effect with our drawing too okay so i'm just going to show and demonstrate what i was talking about here looking at the reference photo again i'm going to say from the top of the page okay about seven or eight centimeters here I'm going to add an anchor point, and that's the top of the mountain on the left hand side. I'm going to go down another five, boom, got another anchor point, and then another five, boom, another anchor point. All right, this is going to help me to determine where the starting point for my drawing is. Same thing on this side, about a full 10 centimeters, maybe 11 or 12. Okay, I'm gonna add another anchor point. This is where the foreground forest begins. And really just understanding the relationship here, we're gonna have this dot connected to this dot, and we're gonna fill in the story in between. Okay, and that's gonna help us to get started here. So the type of line I'm going to draw is going to, again, be a dotted line. And it's gonna be kind of sporadic because I'm just gonna say, these are, let's say these are spruce trees. These, these spruce trees are like cones. They're conical in nature, okay? So it's not gonna be a flat line that we draw across the page. It's gonna kind of look like a Richter scale, like if, if you're looking at an earthquake measuring device or a heart rate monitor. You're gonna have a kind of jagged line that goes across, and you don't have to use dots if you don't want to. I'm just sticking with the rules of the system here. Um, but this is gonna help you to create the first layer, okay? So from left to right across the page, we have our foreground planned, okay? And this is gonna kinda of have a nice little arc to it. It's gonna, this middle ground is gonna arc and disappear behind this foreground. Now, I'm not gonna to have to use the dots there because quite frankly, we don't need to. This is gonna be kind of like a Richter scale again. And, and the way I do this is just very, very randomly, I try to create these little jagged points here because all the tree, not all trees, not every tree is the same size, right? We have a nice randomness to it and it kind of comes down like this. And finally, the mountain range. This I'll go back to using the dots because we have, we have a couple of interesting variations in form with the mountain range, right? I'm just going to work my way across that ridge line, taking note of the different jagged rock formations, some of them square, some of them conical, some of them flat, some of them round. Okay, and I'm going to be able to There we go, get that mountain range accounted for very, very nicely. Now you can also draw the line down the middle to help you know where the center of the page is just like that. My mountain range is a little bit off, but that's okay. I feel like there's a lot of negative space in this area, so I kind of want to exaggerate the length of the mountains to make them go past the middle of the page. Whereas in our photograph, it's kind of ending right around here. That's the beauty as the artist. You can have license to kind of alter reality to become more pleasing to the eye. Not that this isn't a beautiful landscape. I'm just, I have different ideas. So now let's, let's consider how we make trees, okay? When drawing a tree, um, we're taught to think about them in, in, a, in a sort of symbolic sense, right? We have our, I'm just gonna come over on this side of the page. We have archetypes, <laughs> let's say. So the, the two archetypes that we usually encounter, especially with children's drawings, is the Christmas tree and the every other kind of tree. Okay, 
these are the two archetypes that we see. Oh, can't forget the squirrel hole. That's important. Now, the visual language that we've known to understand as, as, uh, as people is that this is the kind of tree that we're going to be drawing, but it doesn't look realistic. We understand, however, that it's a tree. That being said, how do we draw these types of trees looking realistic? Well, it begins with two dots measuring the height of the tree, then two dots measuring the width of the tree. Okay, you're going to wind up with the diamond just like when we did our nature object. Except this time, we're going to look and we're going to notice the way in which the foliage grows on the tree. When it comes to these types of spruce trees, right, these are cone bearing trees, we have a different type of Alter, alternating pattern with the branches. Okay, the branches aren't appearing equal like the rings of a ladder. They appear on every other side. That's why they're alternating, right? So I'm going to start by just scribbling. And notice how I add a branch here, a branch here. I leave a blank space and then I add another branch and then I add another branch. They're not opposite of each other, they're alternating. And that's helping to create a more realistic rendering of the tree. Now, I'm not drawing a trunk on purpose. I'm leaving a lot of white space on purpose because we're going to be working with the power of suggestion. Okay, That's a very important tool to wield as an artist, the power of suggestion. And that's basically saying that the human mind is going to fill in the blanks. Because again, we're, using, we're drawing using a hierarchical language here, a symbolic language. We know that this is a tree, even though it looks nothing like a tree. By the time we get to the end step of this spruce tree here, right? And let's draw the trunk at the bottom. Already, we're starting to compare this to our hierarchical image, our symbolic image. And that's giving us a tree so far. This is registering as tree in our brains. So now, if we were going to make this look more realistic, here's where you can add, again, the simplest thing we can do is add dots, right? If you add dots to fill in the blanks of certain spots, okay? Maybe even throwing in a little bit of trunk in certain spots. Maybe there's a bald patch. Now you're filling in the blanks here. But you're also maintaining this alternating branch arrangement, which is the realistic way in which the tree, these branches grow on trees. Now the human mind, the fickle thing that it is, is going to want to organize this into some sort of recognizable form. That's where the hierarchical language comes in, okay? And people are going to register a tree when they see this. Okay, it looks more realistic, doesn't it? Now, this is how we draw an individual unit, but how do we draw a forest? Okay, remember how I had that little Richter scale line from before? Just like this. It doesn't have to be perfect. Okay, this is how we could add layers. Like, let's say there's a slanting slope here, right? It comes down the mountain just like that. Okay, and then it disappears behind another forest. So, what we can do is rely on this sort of tricky hierarchical language here to fill in the blanks for us. Now imagine if we were to add a couple of these actual trees here. I'm just going to do a little rush job just so you can see. Into the foreground of this Richter scale. Okay, maybe, maybe it goes a little bit higher, right? Maybe it breaches the, the canopy a bit. Okay, what our mind is going to do is fill, fill in the blanks. Okay. And now this, these random Richter scale lines are going to come off as forest because we see two trees in the foreground. Okay, they're not the best looking trees, but you get the point. Two trees in the foreground equals many trees in the background. So rather than trying to draw an entire forest of individual units, you're drawing the forest as an individual unit, saving yourself a ton of time and uh, mental wear and tear. So that's how we're going to draw our trees, okay? Same thing works with this, this paragon of, uh, of tree over here. <laughs> Gotta love the squirrel hole. Okay. So we're coming back to our landscape as a whole, all right? Now, we're going to consider this to be another Richter scale line 
another heart rate monitor line that goes across the page, just like this, and make it random. Don't make everything the same, okay? And if, if you're having trouble with that, it just, it just takes a little bit of letting go to get the random effect. Don't think about it too much, because if it's like dancing, the second you start thinking about it, it gets weird. <laughs> you just gotta dance. So here we go. We have our Richter scale line. Doesn't have to be perfect either. Okay, this is gonna be our forest in the foreground. Now, how do we make this a real forest? Same thing like we did on the opposite side of the page. We're gonna draw a couple of key characters in the foreground, and that's gonna help us to build the mental bridge that we need to interpret all of this background stuff as forest, okay? So we're gonna do this um, very methodically. And, and I really like these little two trees in the corner here. Like if you, if you notice on the landscape reference that I sent, we have two, two little trees down here. They're about yay tall. Actually, it looks like three little trees. That's cool. Okay, three little trees. So what I'm going to do is I put the dot for the top, top and the dot for the bottom, which is the margin, okay? And I'm just gonna work from the top down doing the outline of the tree. Okay, now the outline of the tree is important because we want these to be kind of silhouetted, right? We'll fill in all the other data later. We'll worry about the branches and the foliage later. I just want the outline of the trees, just like this. Okay, we're gonna be picky and choosy. Now let's move over a little bit. Looks like we have a big one that's kind of leaning slightly to the left. So I'm not gonna, don't draw the line I'm drawing right now. This is just to give you an idea that it's, that it's a leaning tree. But draw the two dots, one for the top, one for the bottom, okay? Now, considering the fact that it's a dead tree, we don't have any foliage on it, so we just have this kind of skeleton going on. What you're gonna do is you're going to account for the different types of branches that are growing on the tree, not worrying about every single one, just follow an alternating pattern here, just like that, okay? And now that we are at the bottom, we can add the semblance of a trunk, okay? And I'm just going to fill that in very matter-of-factly, like that, okay? That's it, that's a dead tree, easy peasy. But behind the dead tree, this is where the cool thing happens, we're gonna, we're gonna do our silhouetting magic again. So the top of the tree that's standing directly behind the dead tree is taller than it, meaning that we're gonna add a dot above the dead tree. It's also straighter too, okay? It's going to intersect at a certain point, which is down here. But again, we're gonna focus on the outline of the tree only, okay? And it's gonna look a little Christmas tree-like, you know, we're gonna have that, that kind of archetypical thing going on. But it's the same style as this, right? We're gonna, we're gonna just not fill in the middle because we want to add that nice little silhouette there. Okay. And this is gonna be a good little highlight of that one tree. Okay. And it's going to reinforce the illusion that we are in fact drawing a forest without having to worry about every single tree in that forest. Okay, now this, this tree has neighbors, okay? We're gonna, we're gonna think about its, its neighbors in just a second. But we have a couple of other big features that we wanna draw. Here's another tree right in the foreground, front and center, plants itself right down in the middle over here. And starting from the top, we consider that alternating branch arrangement, leaving the middle blank. Okay, so instead of worrying about just the outside of the tree like we did here, we're actually gonna go in inside the texture of the tree and, and add those dots like we did earlier on the other page. Okay. Again, we're using that power of suggestion here, the human mind, to allow for us to do a fast job, but make it realistic. And I'm just adding dots inside these little blank areas from earlier. And I'm keeping my eye on the reference too. That's another important thing. Don't take your eye off the reference for more than a second because what you wanna do is just verify that the lines and the dots that you're making 
are going in the right spot. But really, the more you look at your reference, the more realistic your drawing is going to be, the better for it. Okay. Nice little landscape right here. Cool. All right. Now, what other characters can we draw? Looking at just scanning the forest. We have, we can probably go across the page making a, a different tree. Okay. Um, yeah, let's do that. Okay. Cause once, once we do this work, we're going to do a little bit of shadowing for the background of this. And that way we're going to have to do minimal work over here. And what I'm going to do is well, I want to add one over here too. Let's, let's kind of give this tree a neighbor coming back over to the right hand side. I want to make sure that it doesn't feel like it's alone. So put a dot on the top, dot on the bottom. That's the height of the tree. And it's going to be covered by other trees too. So it, even if you draw a partial tree, and then shade over the rest of it, you're going to create the proper illusion of a forest. Okay, so even though the tree is this tall, it's gonna be interrupted by another neighbor, right? So maybe we're just gonna draw the top of the tree over here. And this one's gonna be silhouetted, so we're not gonna worry about filling in the guts or the middle of the tree. We're just gonna do another outline like this. Okay, and place it directly next to a bigger neighbor. Now, the cool thing is that tree that we started earlier is just gonna intersect with the tree that's standing in front of it, okay? And now we have two trees for the price of one, all right? And if you wanna go for the bonus, three trees, just put another one right in front of it like this. And this is one that you're gonna actually fill in the skeleton of, because this is gonna be silhouetted against that tree. There you go, three trees for the price of one. And it intersects with these two down here. Okay, so see how we're filling in this forest and how it's becoming more realistic? We're not having to draw literally hundreds of trees. We're gonna to have to draw about a dozen or so to pull it off, but not hundreds of trees. Okay, that's the cool part, that's the cool part. So what about these mountains in the background? Okay, all you have to do, because we did this line work earlier with the dots, is just consider the rugged nature of the stone. And look at how those pieces stand out and they're shifting and they're moving and they're very much alive. Okay, and we have some very interesting shapes. Imagine if you're running across the ridgeline of that mountain range, that would be awesome. Okay, how it dips like a saddle. Okay, cracks. There's all these interesting terrain features there. Geologists love this stuff. <laughs> okay. And again, just to reinforce the point, it doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to match exactly what's happening in the picture. Just like mine, I'm exaggerating the length of the mountain range here of this ridge line because I want it to kind of transverse over the center of the page and kind of fill in more on this side here. So it doesn't have to be exactly accurate, just realistic enough for it to be believable. Okay, we have some really cool features there. Okay, and if you wanna add some dots down the line like that, just be careful with them because you don't wanna overdo the effect. You can add little terrain features like dashes and dots down to give it a rocky kind of texture like this. Dashes and dots. Yeah, I can hear everybody's thoughts. We get it, buddy, you like dots. <laughs> Well, they're work. They're, they work and it's something that everybody can draw. Just like that, dashes and dots, giving my mountain range a little bit of a rocky texture here. Now, what about that foreground that we drew, right? We're gonna get there in a minute, but this mid-range here, I'm just gonna grab my other pencil, my 
shading pencil. And all I'm going to do here is shade this middle area. And I'm going to be very, very gentle again with my application of the material onto the page. And I'm just going to go light enough so that we get a nice, even gray coat. Okay, we do our first layer of light gray material. And then we notice that there's obviously highlights on the trees. So we're going to go again on top of this nice light layer in order to get that effect of a forest. The light trees, the shadowy trees. I'm just doing nice light circles, trying to be consistent, trying to avoid random mark making here. Now I'm gonna do that all the way across from left to right until I hit this little spot over here. Okay. So this is a nice technique for when you have some time to sit. Maybe you have a good half hour or so, taking a rest after a long hike and you're admiring the view. It's a great time to take out your sketchbook and just kind of start taking notes, taking visual notes on the things that you're seeing around you. And figure on making your marks very deliberately. Just give yourself some time to enjoy the view as well as to document what's happening around you. Okay, now that we have this base layer, here's another trick. All I'm gonna do is add darker pyramid shapes. I'm not pressing hard. I'm just adding some more variation here because I wanna get another Richter scale to represent those trees that are getting shadow. And they're gonna be very, very light, and very, very subtle. Okay, and there's a section down here where it's dark all together. But that's gonna add another layer to our forest. Again, we're drawing the forest as a unified whole. We're not drawing individual characters, except in the foreground, okay? And your homework assignment for this particular exercise will be to just finish drawing the trees in the foreground. Don't go too overboard. Use a variation of these silhouettes with these fully fleshed out trees and then stack them on top of each other. So that way you're drawing maybe 12 to 15 individual trees and that's representing the hundreds and thousands that you're seeing in this photo. All right, so that's the technique for doing a landscape. Again, spend some time filling in the foreground with the rest of these trees here. Luckily, this is all one, one or two different species of tree, so it's not like we're drawing a wide variety of flora. But the spruce, again, is expressed in a visual language, okay? We're all used to seeing the, the triangle on a popsicle stick here. Now, if we take that and we add alternating branches, leaving the blank space in the middle. All we have to do is add some dots or some other random marks in order to get a nice fully fleshed out tree. And again, if you want, you can even take your, your shading tool and just shade in that white space, leaving some, but mostly shading it in like that. And this is an alternate in case you don't wanna use the dot method, if you don't like the way that looks. There's another little tip for you. Okay, just like that. And if you leave a little bit of white on the page, it kind of looks like light or snow. Okay, so that's a good little way to make that happen. And again, if um, you want to do the outline of the tree, right, we measure the top and the bottom, the length of the tree. Then just come out on the side like this. Follow the outline or the contour of the tree. All right, they're very bushy. They're very wide. Their leaves, are, their foliage spreads out across the branches. So they're quite covered. 
which means that this will suffice to do an outline. And again, if you want to add another layer, get more bang for your buck, go ahead and draw the skeleton of a tree in front of it. And it's nicely silhouetted by this fully fleshed out tree behind it. Okay, and if you don't want to use the dots, go ahead and grab your shading tool. Nice light circles. Be mindful of preserving some of the white space there. Okay, and now you're rocking and rolling. Two for the price of one. Okay. So feel free to send me an email with your finished landscape. And now we only have about 15 minutes left. We're gonna to proceed to our next and final exercise for the class. Okay. We're gonna talk about some nature journaling tricks and tactics. We're gonna learn the way in which we can maximize the minimal amount of time that we have in order to record our experiences, right? So let's say you're hiking with a group of friends and not everybody's down to let you sit and draw for 20, 30 minutes at a time. You got to move, you got to groove. So we're going to work in a way that will allow us to digest as much information as possible and spit it out onto the page in a way that is very much a scientific approach to recording data, right? We're not gonna be trying to get perfect drawings here. What we're gonna do is instead, we're going to capture the memory in a visual way, okay? And here's an example of that, right? This is a, this is a, actually this is a botanical drawing and this is one of the classes that we run as well. This is, a, this is actually a scientific method or a scientific art form of documenting plant life. But we're not gonna get that involved with our next exercise. Really what I wanna drive home is this. You have multiple vehicles of recording data. You have your drawings, you have the notes that you can write, and you have your measurements, such as temperature, height, width, things like that. So obviously the drawing part is what establishes that nice personal collection, connection. It gives you an opportunity to truly observe something in an uninterrupted way. And it really gives you the training you need to develop a visual, um, a visual type of learning. And, this, and then additionally, drawing and writing together gives you the opportunity to externalize your thought process. And it'll add layers of information to your drawing, which will help to convey what's important about that drawing to the people who are looking at it, right? Using measurements, weather conditions, all that kind of baseline data is real scientific data, okay? And if you're going to go on a hike, Simply writing down the place, the date, and the weather is a contribution to our understanding of the planet because now that's a weather report, okay? So even if you do a tiny little thumbnail sketch, which we're about to do together, you're going to be able to create a lot of value in a very fast and methodical way, okay? So blending it all together, your, your firsthand observations plus your affinity for nature helps you to create beautiful and interesting work. Okay, so this is an example of something we did in our last nature journaling class. This is a tree profile, okay? And the idea is we are using call outs and notes and graphs to tell a story about what we're observing in these trees, right? We're looking at the foliage, we're looking at the type of fruit and reproductive structures. We're noting the types of environment and the animal species that are occupying certain elements of the tree, right? This is a great way to just very quickly, in a visual way, tell a story, okay? And for folks who are teaching classes outdoors, it's a great way to engage your students. Um, let's say, for example, you're, you're leading a hike and it's a, pretty, it's a pretty easy hike. Maybe it's only a quick five mile hike around a lake if it's not physically challenging, what you can do is you can challenge your students or challenge your group in a way to maybe set up a nature scavenger hunt or something that allows them to survey different parts of the environment. You're probably gonna see more wildlife by doing this and discover things like nests and different types of, um, different types of features in the land, okay? So what we're gonna do today is very similar to that, but rather than doing a tree profile, we're gonna do 
a challenge. We're going to do a 15 second memory exercise, okay? Meaning I'm going to play a video clip for you since unfortunately I can't take everybody hiking with me right now. We're going to do the next, next best thing and I'm going to play a video clip for you and you'll have 15 seconds to watch that video without drawing anything. Then from memory, you're going to very quickly take an additional maybe 20 seconds, let's say, and write down what you saw, try to sketch from memory what you saw. And this is a great trick for building up your brain power to have that nice visual um, steel trap of a brain, okay, for when you're starting to draw out in nature. So really quick, we're going to get ready here. All right, and I'm just gonna take another piece of paper. You can see in the tiny little thumbnail on the upper right hand side, all I'm gonna do is take the piece of paper I've been drawing with all along, and I'm just gonna fold it in half the other way. Okay, I'm gonna save paper here. And I'm going to draw a rectangle on the other side of the page. Okay, then what I'm gonna do, very, very quickly, is I'm going to draw a line down the middle vertically, dividing my rectangle in two. And then I'm going to draw a line horizontally, directing, di di bleh, dividing my two rectangles into four. And a drawing will be done in each of these four quadrants. In fact, let me just make sure and, and show you. Okay, so this is how I have my page set up. And if I only have 15 or 20 seconds to do a, a little field sketch here, this is going to be a kind of game for you while you're hiking in nature. You can actually make little thumbnails on an entire page in your sketchbook and just do quick 15, 30 second sketches as you hike and you'll be able to tell a nice story about your experience with everything in a very graphic way. So for example, let's say I'm looking out at a, at a landscape like we were just doing, right? I have my tree line, okay, that's kind of going and disappearing behind these beautiful rolling hills. And by the hills, there's this lake or this river that flows into a lake. Okay, we have some birds flying overhead. What kind of birds are they? Let's just say those are some jays. Okay, and then let's say that these are pine trees. And this is a snapshot right here. This is a snapshot of a piece of my hiking story, okay? It only took a few seconds to get down on paper, but the combination of notes, obviously I'm using an arrow to illustrate a body of water. This is the direction which it's flowing. This is a great way to kind of just get the important details down on paper as fast as possible. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen with you again. We'll have 15 seconds to observe. So I want everybody's pencils down, okay? And what we're going to do next is just watch, okay? And I have a tiny little kitchen timer here. So I'm going to put 15 seconds on the clock and we're just going to look, okay? And that's gonna start in three, two, one, okay? So what's happening here? We have looks like a beautiful tidal pool out in the ocean. We have some rocks. We have some stuff growing on the rocks. Okay. And that's it. That's all the time you get. Okay. I know it's challenging, but that's, there's a point to that. So what did we see here? Okay. So if I were to quickly for 15 seconds, go from memory. Okay. I saw a bunch of rocks. I saw a tidal pool, first of all. So that's the first thing I'll do is I'll write down a tidal pool. Okay, I saw layers of different rocks, but I also saw some interesting stuff growing on the rocks. Did you guys catch that? What's growing on the rocks? Okay, and you could write that down in the form of a question. Okay, and we also have the water coming in and swirling. So this is the current, this is the tide. Okay, and it's kind of whirling around. Okay, that's interesting. What lives here? Right, and that's like a little more than 20 seconds, but 
that's the idea is you want to get a quick little thumbnail or impression of the area. Okay. And if, for example, we look at the clip again, now that we've done that, we're now going to see it in a different way, right? We have all of these questions now, and we have all of these things swirling around our minds. Now that we're taking a second look, what other things are we noticing? Right? It's a great way, and I'll just keep looping this clip here. It's a great way to notice stuff that you wouldn't otherwise notice. Okay, I'm, I'm looking at the fact that there is almost a sort of waterfall happening right here, and I'm wondering if there's maybe a cave or something underneath, or if animals get trapped in there that, you know, if the tide goes out. And all of these little questions are things that you can add into your drawing. So we're going to do this one again. So at this time, I'm going to allow you to actually draw and watch the video at the same time. And think about the, the simplicity of the task, okay? We're not trying to, do, to draw everything perfectly. We're just trying to document what we're seeing in a meaningful way, okay? So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put uh, 20 seconds on the clock for us to, actually, you know what? I'll, I'll put 30 seconds on the clock for us to look and draw and write. and then we'll go ahead and share what we have, all right? And we'll start that in three, two, one, begin. What do we got going on here? Okay, so we have a bird, okay? I don't know what kind of bird it is. Maybe it's a type of robin from Europe, okay? What's he doing? Looks like he ate something. What did he eat? What's he doing? Okay, kind of flittering around, orange on the front. Oh, there he is. Experience over, he's gone. <laughs> and that's it, right? When we're, when we're in nature, unless we're drawing something that is, there's our 30 seconds. Unless we're drawing something that's, that's non-organic or something that was organic and is no longer alive, we really don't have all the time in the world to get a story, okay? So within 30 seconds, all I was able to do is get a tiny little sketch of him, okay? I noticed that he ate something and that the front of it is orange. It's, <laughs> it's crazy. I know it's not, it's not a lot of information, but it just gives you an opportunity to maximize the time you have, okay, in a very meaningful way. Because now, let's say, for example, these are all tied together, right? This is, this is a hike that we just did, okay? So I, I write group hike, I don't know, at, Let's say Fire Island National Seashore. And I have today's date. Okay. Now all of these little sketches have a context. They have a they have a, a place and they have a time. Okay. And as we go ahead and let's say, for example, we keep doing this all day long. We have a few pages in our, in our nature journal that tell an interesting story. And we come back from our hikes with these, with these artifacts here, with our questions, with our answers, with our story. And now if, you know, just looking, looking very holistically at everything that we did today on one sheet of paper, we have our studies of, nature objects and trees and landscapes and we have our tiny little thumbnail drawings it's really a great practice to be mindful out in nature nature um, through art and connecting with nature through art and it's something again it has a very very low barrier to entry you don't have to be an artist you don't have to be an extraordinary renderer of things all you have to do is be observant and be willing to look and open your mind and your senses to what's happening around you and document it accordingly. All right. So that is pretty much it for today. Um, I'm just going to share really quick my screen with you again. Hello, bird. And that's not a bird we get in Long Island. I think that I've only seen this bird in Ireland. But all right, so I want you folks to take all the lessons that you've gathered today in class, right? From our nature object drawing to our lesson on drawing trees and landscapes and also our nature journaling skills. And 
incorporate that into your next hike or nature meditation. In fact, if you make hiking or nature meditation a part of your weekly or even your daily routine, you're really going to start noticing more about what's happening in the natural world about you. And if you find that you're extremely interested in a particular subject matter, whether that's bugs, birds, plants, whatever, read up and become knowledgeable on that subject. And that way you'll become a subject matter expert over time. And that really puts you in a great, a great position to teach people what you've learned. It's also a great way to keep a nature journal, stay consistent, Make that something that is perfectly for you and only you. And that way you won't be pressured to make it perfect. If anything, that it, it, look, look this, we, we went over a lot today, I know. But if, if you take home only one thing today, take home this. You're spending time in nature and you're learning about everything around you in a visual way. Got it, right? That's, that's, the, that's the idea here. But the thing I want you to take away is that it is a practice that is for you. It's a way for you to connect with nature. And it, you're under no obligation to share your work with other people. That being said, if you do want to share your work with other people and you want to join a community of nature artists, here's one for you. Um, I run uh, this particular group on Facebook. It's called Hike and Draw. So if you go to facebook.com slash group slash hike and draw, You'll be able to share your work with other nature artists, other nature lovers, share pictures from your hikes, share questions that you have, and you have a great community of people to answer those for you. I also offer discounts on my workshops that I run. Uh, I offer downloadable drawing resources and, and other tools as well. So if you're interested, if you had fun today and you're interested in joining another workshop, here's our schedule. We're already done with October, so here we are in November. Um, Upcoming uh, workshops include a uh, map making workshop. We have uh, our draw nature drawing intro where we go into more detail about our drawing system. We have our botanical drawing intro, which is a great marriage between science and art. We also have a very special workshop coming up. Uh, it's actually a really imaginative creation of a colleague of mine, uh, Connor Nolan. It's a nature drawing workshop inspired by fantasy, right? So this is gonna be kind of a, a real interesting twist to um, a, a thing that we already love, which is nature and art. Um, and then finally, if you join the Hike and Draw community on Facebook, we're holding a live draw social on the evening of the 27th, okay? This is not a workshop. Instead, this is just a chance for us to get together as a community and have some fun drawing together. Uh, oh, and then finally, we end the month with our nature journaling class. Okay, all their workshops and updates are on the Eventbrite page. Also, you can go to hikeanddraw.nyc for more updates there as well. And thank you so much. If you enjoyed the class today, be sure to share this with a friend. Uh, I'll be giving you a link to watch the video, and I'll also be giving you a course packet. And if you feel so inclined, this is my Venmo handle if you wish to leave a tip. Thank you so much. Thanks, James. That was